to everybody. I'm glad that you're here with us as we celebrate. Um, if you come and go this week through the downstairs door into the elevator room, be careful when you open and close the door because we have a bird and the bird is a mother now and the babies are in our wreath on, in a little nest on the door to that, to the back door back there. And so I propped it open this morning so the babies wouldn't get slammed back and forth. <laughs> I know, I know. So, but as you come and go in that door in the next week or so, first off, be mindful because sometimes when you park there at the door, a bird pops out, scares you. And, but there are babies there right now. So, and if you look, you can see the nest. It's, they put the nest right on top of our wreath. So, you know, it's, I think it's a robin. So anyway, that's why the doors open downstairs. And so just be careful if you come in. And um, so our bird, our church bird now is a mother. So happy Mother's Day to our church bird. Uh, normally on Mother's Day, we get baby bottles. Uh, to give change to the Tri Area Pregnancy Center. This year, we're just gonna take a love offering. It's at the back and there's a little basket there that says love offering. And um, we're gonna do it this Sunday and next Sunday if you'd like to give something to their good cause. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day and um, all of the charities are struggling because like the Gideons are struggling because they haven't been able to come into churches. Uh, the, the pregnancy center is struggling because normally they have stuff going on to bring money in to help with the, the things that they give away. And, um, and there's more, I mean, God's storehouse is struggling and they're getting grants now, but I mean, you know, it's just, um, the, because of how long that the virus restrictions have gone on, we have to remember that, you know, there's some people that are out there that are still struggling. And so we're going to do this for the Tri-Area Pregnancy Center. And um, so if you'd like to participate, like I said, the basket's back there. And a uh, couple of things I'd like to tell you about. Uh, Reba said that she talked to Mickey yesterday and Janet has been able to eat a little bit, but uh, she's going down to the cancer center at Mount Airy on Tuesday and um, find out about the chemo. So let's keep keeping them prayed up and uh, sending cards and calling and just checking in on them as they go through this. Um, Glenn's daughter, Vicki, had her surgery this week, and uh, she's done good from the surgery. She goes back tomorrow and uh, finds out the lab results. So I hope that um, you'll continue to keep Vicki in your prayers. Um, our regional minister, Bill, uh, his son, Tristan, Bill put a post on this morning that um, Tristan's PET scan this week showed something, something lit up. And so um, they go back next week to do some more testing to see what it is. He said, the doc he said they all went all to pieces, but the doctor is still encouraging and says this cancer is beatable. And even if it is, they said this could even be that his bone marrow is starting to work again. So they don't know what it is, but just keep Tristan and Bill and, and his wife prayed up this week. Uh, Max, is, Max Brown is in his, uh, has got his treatment, his, his CAR T cells, and, and they just go back and forth right now. Uh, it's, a, it's like a month and a half they have to wait to see if they, if they kick in. 
So let's keep them prayed up. Um, Hillcrest Church lost Bonnie Gallion. That's their second member in a couple of weeks. So remember her family and your prayers. And over at Hillsville, James Parnell, who had, uh, he did lime and fertilizer and um, worked with the Shriners, uh, was a good friend of my dad's. He died this week as well. So keep them in your prayers. Are there other people that we should pray for? We're glad to see. Junior? Mm-hmm. Well, good, good. Yes, it, you know, even when you recover from it, it's, it's just, it's hard to get your strength back. Uh, Brenda should be home uh, from her rehab. Uh, I haven't talked to her this week, but she should be home. And I haven't heard anything from Barbara Kirby, so I can't share anything there with you all. Um, but it's wonderful that we're all here together. Uh, it's wonderful that we get to celebrate Mother's Day together. And um, I thank you for coming, and we'll get started. Oh, wait, Bruce has something. Okay. It takes a lot for me to be up here today. Um, I'm not very much of a good speaker or anything, but today is about Mother's Day. And I have never been so honored to have so many mothers in this church. So I want to say thank you for being my mother. But I want to recognize one special person, my mother. <laughs> Mom, me and you, we've been through ooh, so much. And I want to say, I thank you for everything you have ever done for me. And I just want to applause this beautiful woman back here because this is the only woman in my life that has never gave up on me. So, Mom, happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Bruce. You're right. It's... Our mothers are the one people in our lives that never give up on us. So, and we appreciate them. Okay, Carla.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful, glorious day it is to be in your house. Father, we feel like that this week we've seen the mightiness of your plan. We felt all four seasons in a week. Father, we we love to see spring. We love to see our flowers budding out, our yards turning green, the leaves coming out on the trees. It helps us to feel reborn, and it helps us to renew our commitment to you, to being your people and to following your ways. Father, as we come together here on a day meant to honor our mothers, we remember that you made the mothers. You made each one of us to be born of a mother. You made us to honor them, to honor our fathers and our mothers. And Father, we thank you for this wondrous plan that you've given us, this wondrous plan that you have laid out in this beautiful world we live in. Father, we especially come together this morning to thank you for the gift of your son because it was his death on the cross so long ago that gave us our ultimate gift, salvation. And as we come together to pray the prayer that he prayed and taught us to pray, Father, we remember and we remember the great sacrifice made on our behalf and we remember that each one of these words has particular and special meaning to us. They may be words that we memorized 70 years ago, but Father, the words of this prayer hold everything that is in our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, give it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, maybe. Oh, no, we get to sing. I've, I've never been here before. Uh, leaning on the everlasting arms.
ready to eat it. As we come around our communion table, we're blessed that we can be here each Sunday morning, that we can celebrate communion together. We're blessed that we can remember that sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We can remember that we're not alone ever. We might be alone physically. We might sit sometimes in a house, um, but we're never alone. God is always with us. He's never more than a whisper away from us. He constantly is helping us in our daily lives and to come around this table and remember that his son gave his life for each one of us is humbling and it's almost more than you can think about that somebody died 2,000 years ago but yet knew our sins. And as we come together to remember the broken body and the spilt blood, as Carlene plays our hymn of communion, would you prepare your communion? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that your son made on our behalf. We thank you for the grace that you show us. Father, we thank you that even though we are human, we are frail, and we make mistakes, we sin against you, Father, you love us still. You see the heart in the midst of all the humanness. You see the soul that is bared before you, and still you love us. And Father, we thank you that we can come together as your church family, that we can openly and honestly tell the world that we are your children, Father, we thank you that we can openly and honestly tell the world that you are our one true God. And we thank you that we can say that we believe that your son died on the cross for each one of our sins, that he was buried and he rose again. Father, we thank you for the promise of that resurrection. And as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we ask you to bless them and bless us to your service in the coming days. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your bread. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and gave it to the disciples. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he said to them, This is my body, which is given for you. 
Eat this in remembrance of me. If you'll take your cup. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to the disciples, and he said to them, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we came into our sanctuary, we left our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. We added this week a love offering for a charity here in our area. Father, we ask that you bless each one of those gifts, that you multiply them to use for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. Father, we thank you that we have the ability to give back to you, but a small part of what you give to us each and every day. Father, we ask that as we go forward in our lives, we constantly remember that you give so freely to us that we are to give back to you just a tenth of what we're given. It's something that we can never achieve because there's just, it's uncountable. We can't enumerate it in any of the ways that we can count for anything. But Father, we know that your gift of salvation, your promise to us of eternal life, is the thing that we live for. It's the thing that, that we're constantly striving towards. And Father, we thank you that we can come in to your sanctuary, that we can be together, that we can worship you, that we can sit here and acknowledge our sins, that we can sit here and hear your word, that we can stand and sing your praises, but that we can be together as your church family as we go forward renewed in your spirit, ready to face a week in the world. We thank you for the gifts that you give us each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
Greetings to uh, everyone this morning, and especially we want to uh, greet our mothers, and uh, we certainly are thankful for them, and uh, uh, this, uh, this day really began with uh, Mother's Day up near Fairmont, West Virginia, about the turn of the last century, and uh, so it's certainly fitting that we remember our mothers. I recall... Uh, in the 55 years that I've been in the ministry, uh, preaching on some subjects uh, on Mother's Day, uh, especially uh, Proverbs 31 and some other passages of Scripture that apply uh, specifically to mothers. But uh, this is the first time I believe I've ever preached on uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, on Mother's Day. Uh, just before we uh, get into our sermon this morning, I'd like to uh, mention another need that we have in our family. We certainly appreciate the fact that, uh, that we had such wonderful prayer support from the church for my daughter, Vicki. But uh, this morning, my brother-in-law, Charlene's brother, uh, is uh, listed as uh, critical in uh, the intensive care unit at... Uh, at Duke, uh, he's on a ventilator, and uh, he is uh, struggling with uh, uh, some of the side effects of multiple myeloma. And uh, Bill uh, certainly stands in need of our prayers as well as the uh, rest of the family. So uh, before we get into our sermon, let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. God, our Father, we... We worship no human being, nor do we worship any of the memories of the saints past. But we certainly feel it's important that we remember them. And we thank you, Lord, for all of those, both husbands and wives, that have contributed to the continuation of the faith that you once delivered to the saints. We especially thank you, Lord, for your mother, Mary, who uh, set such an example for us in so many ways, and we thank you for, for her impact upon our world in which we live in today. We thank you uh, for uh, the many of the saints who make up this congregation, some who are unable to attend this morning, but throughout their lives, they've made many contributions. And one that is most important is that of being mothers and then the fathers in supportive roles to them. So, Lord, we ask your blessings upon our assembly and upon our thoughts as we look to you in this hour for help for those that are in special need. We pray for Bill. We pray for others that have been mentioned today standing in special need of prayer we ask that you bless them you strengthen them that your hand of healing would rest upon them and that you would bring fullness of health to them according to your will and glory for we ask it all in jesus name amen The uh, scripture text that I chose to emphasize this morning as we look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, is found in the book of Acts, the first chapter, looking at verses 13 through 14. It says, And when they came in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Athephus, and Simon's, uh, Simon's zealots, and Judas, just, uh, Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with his brethren. May God bless the reading of his word. Here we find a, a different setting for Mary. Uh, just a little over 40 days before, she was at the foot of the cross. She was there with, uh, with the other Mary, 
She was there with the two thieves and with Jesus, and she was there in the presence of God. And uh, probably one of the most agonizing moments as she was there was not the phrase that Jesus uttered, for it is finished, but it was the phrase, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So in a moment of time when Jesus assumed the nature of sin on the cross as a substitute for all of us, God's presence was not experienced by Jesus in that moment because God is intolerable of sin. One of the seven things that tells us that we'll not be in heaven is sin. So there has to be a way for us all to be rid of sin. And so Mary stood there and listened to these words. There were words of comfort from Jesus to Mary upon the cross. As he looked down, he fulfilled his responsibility as the oldest son. The oldest son in every family was responsible for the well-being of his parents. Some of us, I guess, think that uh, Social Security dates back to the time of Adam, but it doesn't. It only started in 1935. So people always used to have to depend upon family uh, in advanced age. Sometimes uh, the family farm would go to one child or, or the other to care for their ailing and aging parents. And uh, so as Jesus looked down, the responsibility ultimately fell on his shoulders. And he could have passed it to one of the other brothers who was found here in the upper room as they mentioned the, the brethren who were there. There was uh, James and Jose and Jude that uh, were named as brothers of Jesus. And he could have assigned them the responsibility of picking up uh, the care for their mother. But instead he looked down and he saw the disciples that uh, John describes as the disciple whom Jesus loved, as though Jesus' love was a personal kind of thing that was directed only to him. There's a lesson for all of us here in that we ought to feel God's love through his son Jesus as being a personal love, as belonging to us, as being directed to us, not just directed to masses of people, but John described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And as he looked upon him, he spoke to him and he said, Son, behold thy mother. Woman, behold thy son. So in this way, he had shifted the responsibility uh, of caring for his mother from one of his own brothers to John. And this was not done idly. This was done by planning because it was for the best for the cause of the gospel. Now, by the time uh, John wrote the Revelation, 11 out of the 12 disciples were dead. They died, all died as martyrs. They were killed for the cause of the faith. And John alone was left. John, it is thought, was the youngest of the disciples whom Jesus selected. And for a responsibility that heavy, you wouldn't think that God would pick out a young man. But he did. And of course, John was faithful as he was finally the Roman authorities recognized that they were not going to step out, stamp out this new movement called Christianity by killing off its leadership. Because the more they killed the apostles, the more the church grew. And it continued to grow. In a 24 month period, everyone in Asia, the scripture says, but it literally what it means is Asia Minor, that everyone, both Jew and Greek, had heard the gospel in a 24 month period. So the gospel was continuing to gain speed and and converts were being made. And some of those who opposed it said, these men have turned the world upside down. So they had made changes. 
Today, sometimes we sit around rather passively uh, waiting for something to happen on our behalf rather than being proactive and trying to turn the world upside down. But as we look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, first of all, we know that God planned to send His Son into the world before the foundations of the world. So, who would He choose? One of the things that we know that He chose was the time. Galatians tells us, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. So God selected just the right time. And the time that God selected was a time that the Roman Empire had taken control of this world empire that had been under the control of the Greeks for hundreds of years. And the Romans now had seized power and influence throughout the world. And so when the angel says, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, it was true. There was no wars uh, being waged uh, against uh, each other, a nation against nation. There were some minor insurrections. There were, they were uh, people that uh, were in rebellion against the Roman Empire, but basically nation was at peace with other nations. So it was a time of peace. The time that God chose for the death of His Son was at the time of the Passover, when about 25,000 people, pilgrims, was gathered into Jerusalem, and they heard all the rumors about Jesus. And then those who were curious enough went out to the cross, and they saw Him hanging there. And they saw a sign above His head, and it said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So it was, it was there in Latin, and in Greek, and in Hebrew. So they were able to read the advertisement about who and what Jesus was. And so with fin such finite planning that God did, how much energy do you think He put into planning for who would bear His Son? I believe that there was a, a tremendous amount of planning on God's part as to who this person would be. And he prophesied, he said, that, that he would be born of the tribe of Judah. He would be born of one of the two tribes of the southern kingdom. And, uh, of course, this basically required his, his uh, stepfather to be from, from uh, Judah, as well as uh, the mother, and probably... Uh, uh, Joseph and Mary both were descendants of Judah and therefore they were distant cousins. At this point, uh, they may have been 25th cousins or so. Uh, so uh, he was, he had said he was going to be from, from the uh, descendant of Judah and he would also be a descendant of David. And one day he would reign upon the throne of his father David meaning his ancestor, David. And so all of this was planned out. And with all the people of the kingdom, uh, God had to make a choice. And God chose so many special people that surrounded Jesus. Here are the names that we reeled off here in Acts 1, 13 through 14. Those that were gathered in the upper room. God, I think, took, paid special attention to these men that he called Peter. In some ways, early in life, he could be considered a failure. A rugged fisherman, perhaps rather crude in his language. And James and John and Andrew were all from a fishing village along the Sea of Galilee. And uh, so as you continue to uh, uh, look at, at the various disciples, in one of the lists in the New Testament, we see the name of Nathaniel. And uh, one of the things that we discover about Nathaniel that Jesus affirmed was uh, that he was a man in whom there was no guile found. He was a good man. He was an honest man. 
He was a good moral person. But this man doubted, and, and this man was prejudiced to people based on where they lived. I grew up in a community that uh, had prejudice uh, based on what geographical area of town you live. If you lived in an area that was called Stumpy Bottom, you were considered sort of low life. But if you lived on Circle Drive, where most of the doctors and lawyers live, you were considered upper class. And um, so when the brother of Nathaniel said, we have found the Messiah. He's down there and John was baptizing and he came down and John said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And we looked and there was this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel spoke up and interrupted him and said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Prejudiced based on the community that somebody came from. And so his brother's response was, come and see. Come and examine, look at Jesus and try him. You know, people have flirted with various avenues in life. They've tried this thing and that thing and the other thing, and nothing has brought them any peace and satisfaction. Why don't you take the advice given to Nathaniel, try Jesus and see what he can do for you. He came into the world to give you life and to give it in a fuller way. But for Jesus to arrive at the point of his earthly ministry, which was the age of 30, he had a lot of parenting, 30 years of parenting. It's obvious that Jesus was close to his parents he probably served an apprenticeship under his father, as was the custom of that era. What happened was that if you grew up in a fishing community, you learned to fish. All of the disciples who were fishermen, their fathers and their forefathers before them were fishermen. And they learned the trade. And they added to the knowledge that was passed on to them by their parents. And so Jesus was the son of a carpenter. Joseph was a carpenter. And I have a feeling that Jesus was skilled in carpentry and uh, probably worked in that until he reached 30, which was the age it required to be qualified as a priest. Jesus was both our priest and Hebrews tells us our high priest. But he didn't start his ministry until he was qualified age-wise to become a priest. He was the priest, Paul said, of the order of Melchizedek. Well, now all the other priests of that day came from the line of either Aaron, um, which uh, was a, a priestly uh, line, or, or Levi. But Jesus wasn't from Levi or Aaron. He was from Judah. And Paul says, well, the way, way he qualif qualified to be our priest and our high priest was through the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest who appeared on the scene early in the book of Genesis, and he ran into Abraham. Well, when we say that, it's almost like an accidental meeting. But I don't think it was accidental. I think it was purposeful. So this priest named Melchizedek came to Abraham. And Abraham went back into his tent and he gathered up all kinds of valuables. 10% of all that he owned. And he brought them out and he gave them to Melchizedek, that priest. And the priest packed them up and left with 10% of Abraham's goods. And so Paul was saying that Jesus was of the order of Melchizedek. And that's the way he qualified as a priest. But Mary was of the tribe of Judah, and Joseph was uh, probably of the tribe of Judah. And so uh, when Jesus was born, he fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament pertaining to his birth and earthly ministry uh, over the next 33 years. But 
four-fifths of the prophecies concerning Jesus doesn't deal with his birth and the next 30 years of his life, but four-fifths or 80% of what happens as far as Jesus is concerned is about his second coming. And so as Jews read the Old Testament, they were looking for a conquering Messiah. They were looking for him to come as an adult. They were looking for him to come in power and put under dominion all foreign powers and cast them out of Israel and that Israel would again be restored. And so here, God selected carefully all these men that were listed as apostles. Before the end of the first chapter of Acts, they picked out the 12th to take the place of Judas who had betrayed Jesus and then went out and hanged himself. And that lot fell, it was a choice between two men and the lot fell to Matthias. And this is the last we ever hear of Matthias. We don't know exactly what happened with Matthias, but we, we do know that many people think that actually the Apostle Paul was God's ultimate choice to take the apostleship that was left by Judas. But nevertheless, here these people were selected because of various talents and abilities that they had. And so here is this 15 or 16 year old woman who was in Nazareth, this place that the rest of them looked down on. You know, it's bad enough to be from, from Galilee. You know, they were looking for Jesus to come, the Messiah to come from Judea, from Bethlehem of Judea. Little did they know that's where he was born. But when they re referenced Jesus, they always said Jesus of Nazareth. And so here's this man born on the wrong side of the tracks, picks up this rough and tumble group that came, continued to follow him around for three years. So there was nothing about his associates and things of this nature in his background that would attract people to Jesus but it was his lifestyle. It's what he did and how he dealt with people on a daily basis that attracted people to Jesus. Massive crowds sometimes of five and 7,000 men, plus the women and children. We don't know how many women and children there were. They didn't, they didn't do counts of them. Sort of like in America before suffrage. <laughs> women didn't count. They couldn't vote. They could be mothers, they could raise our children, but they weren't expected to vote. And so here, Mary comes from this kind of setting. And uh, she probably was, uh, she may have been as early as 14 or 15 or 16. She was an early teenager when God called upon her to take the task of raising the Son of God. And uh, most young women, as they uh, think about marriage and everything, they sort of plan it out in their mind what they would like their marriage to be like. And so often in today's world, those fantasies are dashed at an early age because uh, many things get in the way, family strife and so forth, that keeps people from achieving their dreams. But this woman no doubt had her dreams about this fine carpenter in the community where she lived and she was expecting uh, to uh, raise perhaps a large family, which was traditional in that day. And she was hoping to have uh, wonderful children. But one of the things that she wasn't planning on was shame to come to her name and the family's name because of something especially that she didn't do. She was betrothed to Joseph. And the angel says, this thing that uh, is come upon you of the Holy Ghost, this conception, this immaculate, divine conception, which happened in an instant of time, now she was found with child. And uh, you can imagine, you know, the law in that day would, uh, 
would have permitted uh, execution probably uh, for somebody who's a spouse to another uh, in that day and age uh, engagement was as binding as marriage and it took a, a, a bill that would free a person from the responsibility of marriage uh, much like a divorce and uh, Joseph had decided to put her aside uh, with as little trouble as possible that he could create for until the angel came and said, don't you do that thing to that woman for what she has in her is of God. It's the Holy Spirit. And Joseph listened and Mary listened and they complied and they began to bring up Jesus. And he so influenced his brothers and whatever sisters he may have had because most of the time women were not recorded Again, in the Bible, uh, in the lineage of Jesus, 28 generations, two women are mentioned. Rahab and Ruth. And that's it. The rest of them are men. And so women didn't get a lot of credit for what they did. So uh, at any rate, uh, Mary uh, accepted this responsibility and accepted this privilege. And she fostered it. And she carried it out her whole life. And what it engendered in her was an absolute confidence and faith in her son. You know, I think that you'll find very few people in life who become a success in spite of, the, of negative predictions by their parents. What if your dad or your mother looked at you and said, well, son, I don't believe you're ever going to amount to anything. No belief, no confidence instilled by a parent to a child. But she believed that Jesus could do anything and that we should trust him for that. One day, in the second chapter, chapter of John, Mary went up to Cana of Galilee to a wedding, and Jesus was also there. And the governor says, we have no wine. And Mary sent word to Jesus, go tell Jesus that they have no wine. And uh, so they went and told Jesus, and he said, well, what have I to do with thee? My time has not yet come. But, and the servants came back and said, this is what Jesus said. And Mary said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. She had absolute confidence that her son could do anything. All oh, that the parents of children today would instill within their children, you can be anything by God's help. You can, you can look to the future of, with promise if you'll work and prepare and be ready for it. And they came up to Jesus and said, uh, your mother said, uh, whatever you say for us to do, we're going to do. And Jesus says, you fill up those 12 firkins of, of water pots over there with water and bear them up to the governor of the feast and let him do the tasting and so forth. And they thought, how crazy. How crazy is this thing that Jesus has told us to do? But you know what they did? They did exactly what Mary said they should do, and that was to believe Jesus. And they went and they got those water pots, and we're going to be laughed out of the feast when we bring a bunch of water up here after they've ran out of wine. But they bore it up to the governor of the feast, and the governor of the feast tasted it, and they said, what in the world is going on here? And they were ready for him to rip them up the back for what they did. He said most people, what they do is they set before the guest, the best wine. And when men are well drunk, and then they bring on this, this wine that's inferior. But you have saved the best wine to last. Jesus not only made it, but he made it better than anybody had ever made it before. Jesus doesn't do anything halfway. When Jesus converts us and calls us into his kingdom, he equips us and he expects us to act. And so Mary believed that Jesus was all that he claimed to be. 
And we need to believe that Jesus is all that he claims to be. And we need to be respectful of the household that we have been born into. Honor our mothers and our fathers. And the days upon the land that the Lord thy God has given thee shall be long. For a man's days are three score and ten, and by reasonable strength four score. But if you honor your mother and your father, your days upon this earth will be even longer than that. And so God has given us these promises. We need to be especially thankful that God has given us the special person in our lives. And with many of us, it's more than one person who has been motherly to us. Uh, my, uh, the first 15 years of my life, uh, I lived with my grandmother. Uh, and when my mother came around, I didn't say, hello, mother. I said, hello, Hazel. That was her first name. And uh, she was sort of like a sister to me as opposed to a mother. And then at 15, I went home and lived with the uh, rest of the family. And that was true out of four out of six of us. But uh, we, we all tried to respect our parents, and we, were, we, we have been blessed by it. And so uh, whoever has played a motherly role in your life, today would be a great day to thank them for it, to be appreciative of what God has given you in the way of parentage. So uh, if you're here without Jesus Christ, we're going to invite you to accept him as Lord and Savior of your life, and you will please your mother, wherever she is, whether she's living or whether she's gone on before you, she desires that you come to him. And would you do that as we stand and sing together?